Hey everybody, welcome to Contra Talk. My name is Richard Henry, and uh, my guest today is Brian Schutte. He is a lawyer out of Bowling Green, Kentucky. Uh, he's a friend of the ministry here, uh, the channel, I guess, and um, really wonderful guy. He's been a lawyer for, how long have you been a lawyer now? Uh, very soon to be 31 years. 31 years. That's unbelievable. That's great. Well, welcome to the show, Brian. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so you're married. You've got how many children? Uh, I'm married uh, to Christy. We've been married almost 32 years. Okay. And I have two children, a daughter 27 and a daughter 23. Nice. Um, and you practice law. You also have a ministry uh, called Acts, the Act 6 Project? That's right. Act Acts 6 Project, which is... Uh, Kind of part of the law, uh, the law firm, and maybe a little bit also standalone. Okay, so. wonderful. So practicing law for a long time, out of Bowling Green, uh, and where can people find you? The law firm website is slg.legal. Okay, and then the Act Six Project is just actsixproject.com with the number six. Very good. Um, and I remember when you first uh, you found the channel and you emailed. I was like, why is there a lawyer emailing? I was like, are we getting sued or something like that? My webmaster, he was like, you might want to look at this. And I was like, oh, man, what's going on? <laughs> and it was a, a wonderful uh, email, not a terrible email. So it's good. People are rarely happy to hear from a lawyer, <laughs> at least at first. It's so. very true. It's very true. Uh, well, again, thanks for taking time out of your day and, and joining me here. Um, why? We'll, we'll talk about a few different things. We're going to talk about kind of the uh, SBC executive committee stuff somewhat and what it means to waive client privileges and other things that are going on that a lot of people don't really know uh, what exactly is happening or don't have a, a good grasp. Uh, but before we get there, what do you, or rather, why did you want to go into law? What, what prompted you to, to go into law? So between my junior and senior years of high school, I went to summer school. I had this plan to graduate a semester early. It actually didn't work out, but anyway, hmm. that caused me to go to summer school. And one of the classes that's required in Kentucky, it's a civics class, but they, they just call it government. Okay. And I took that class and we, we studied uh, legal cases and I was absolutely fascinated. And I decided then that I really think I wanted to be a lawyer. Okay. And so that, that was the path pretty consistently that I pursued over the next few years. Okay. And where did you go to law school? University of Louisville. Louisville, okay. Yeah. Very good, very good. Um, and would you have any words? I know, obviously, the climate of, of our world is quite different than it was 30-plus years ago. Uh, would you still encourage, you know, maybe young people watching this at some point to go into law, or is it still kind of like, well, maybe, maybe not, or absolutely not? What, what are your thoughts on that? You know, I kind of think of it in terms of, um, spiritual commitments and calling. Okay. And, you know, if you're a believer, you know that God has called you to do something and he's, he's gifted you to do something. And, you know, I think like any other major decision or even minor decision, it's something that you should really seek the Lord's direction about. Mm -hmm. And he may not tell you, but he may direct your steps in such a way that it becomes clear to you what his plans are for you. And, you know, I, whenever uh, I've had opportunities to talk to young men who were wrestling with the question of whether they ought to go into ministry, and I, I always tell them, you should go into ministry only if you can't not go into ministry. Mm. And I would say, to a lesser degree, law practice is like that. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that being a lawyer is any harder than any other job. I, I think every job has its challenges and, and, and its, you know, parts that are fun. But I, I, and I don't mean to give you a convoluted answer here. I, I guess I would say be a lawyer if you think that's the thing that you need to do. Okay. Um, there, there is a, an abundance of ministry opportunity in, in law practice, I will say that. Okay. Well, that's encouraging. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely encouraging for sure. But like neither of my children are going, in, going into law. Yeah. Uh, one of them is married. The other one's engaged. Neither of their uh, husband and fiance, respectively, are, are interested in law. Hmm. And so I guess maybe my girls grew up watching the demands that law practice puts on a person. And, you know, there is a cost to the family of, of a demanding profession. And the law, if you do it right, is a demanding profession. So I'm not sure that uh, they have much interest in it just because of what they saw. Yeah. Okay. Off-the-cuff question, do you have to be good at arguing to be a good lawyer? 
I think that's a bit of a misconception. You know, <laughs> people, if someone has an argumentative personality, they say, oh, you ought to be a lawyer. Yeah. I, I consider what I do to be much more about problem solving okay. than I do about arguing. You know, um, and, and I guess different lawyers approach it in different ways. But the cases where I feel like I've done the best and the most good are those cases when I've been able to help people come together, even if there's an element of, of uh, adversarial interaction to it. In the end, the goal is to get people to come together. And uh, argument may be a small part of it, but that's by no means is that the largest part of law practice. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. it's good to know. Um, you want to talk a little bit about your Act 6, and then we'll we'll jump into the kind of stuff that's going on with the yeah, SBC? sure. So just tell us, why would someone um, benefit, or rather, what is Act 6, and would somebody watching uh, or listening benefit uh, from, from the services there? So the Act 6 project is a nonprofit legal ministry, and what we do is we help churches in three main areas. Uh, we help churches with organizational documents. We help churches with some conflict resolution. And then we help churches with uh, leadership training, mm -hmm. uh, obviously from a legal perspective. Okay. And I think the benefit to churches is, the, is to take advantage of the opportunity to use some legal tools um, in order to promote um, sound doctrine, to, to kind of build a wall uh, around the church's sound doctrine and protect it, mm -hmm. um, and and to promote uh, peaceful practices within the church, uh, and and then lastly to promote unity within the church. And it's been my experience, and I've worked with a lot of churches all over, really the eastern half of the United States, but also some out west. And I, I have found that the churches that go through the process that that we do, um, they they experience those benefits. Okay, wonderful. No, that's very good. So you can reach out to Brian if you do need some services or even have some questions. Um, yeah, I've heard good things. Only from you, though, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, a little, little bias. No. Hear that with a grain of salt. We're all yeah. biased, right? Um, no, that's good. I appreciate you sharing that. With SBC stuff, so I'm SBC. I'm the SBC pastor. Are you guys in the SBC? Yeah, we're a KBC church, and I think that makes us an SBC yeah. church. I, yeah. I go to Crossland Community Church in Bowling Green. Okay. So Crossland.tv is the website for okay. it. And I would describe Crossland as a very theologically conservative church that is maybe a little less uh, conservative when it comes to methodology. Like we, we would have contemporary worship, um, kind of an emphasis on the life group approach, although yeah. we, we have... Uh, recently started back uh, with Sunday school classes. It's always been a space issue for us. Mm. Um, it's a large church with uh, three different campuses, uh, a main campus in Bowling Green, and then campuses in Glasgow and Morgantown. Oh, and, okay. uh, but it's, uh, you know, consistently week in and week out, we get very sound uh, preaching from the pulpit. And I I've been there about 15 years now. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a remarkable place. I'm, I'm very devoted. Yeah, so. praise God. That's good. Um, with, so I, I know very little, and most people listening, watching, don't probably know a lot either as far as the legally stuff that's happening. Now, there's other things with, you know, McLean Bible Church, David Platt's church, the church suing the leaders. We're not really going to touch on that unless you want to. Um, but other churches have sued or churches have been sued by their congregations and so on. And especially with the SBC right now, the SBC just kind of for everybody is um, there's a president and he appoints the committees and then they appoint other committees. And there's the executive committee who isn't led by the president, but rather the CEO, which is kind of funny language, but it is what it is, um, led by a CEO of the executive committee. And there's been a lot of mishandling, a lot of suspicious things. And Brian's been following it more than I have. Um, and especially, I know it was a couple months ago now, what was the lingo? They waived, a, no. So they, they waived the attorney-client privilege. Okay. So I, I, Explain I can, that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, give you a little bit of background on that. So um, part of what we do, and it sort of falls into this conflict resolution heading, uh, although it's, it's really a little different, but generally, is some investigations. And so if there is an allegation of abuse, and I've, I've handled a number of these, um, we'll come in and interview witnesses, examine you know whatever evidence is available, 
and then advise the church on how best to approach that. Well, most of the interactions involving the attorney are privileged you know, under the attorney-client privilege, and that's, that was the case with the investigations conducted uh, at the request of the SBC of various matters, and it, yeah, I'm sure everybody that follows SBC issues uh, is, is aware of the Houston Chronicle mm-hmm. uh, series of articles that uh, exposed uh, some issues related to abuse, and uh, I'm certain that some of it is quite legitimate and, and does point to some serious issues. And the, the activists who are you know, um, trying to influence the SBC's response to all of that have urged that the SBC should waive the attorney-client privilege, which would open up the investigative files uh, to those who are seeking some sort of, of uh, remedy against the SBC or SBC uh, entities or individuals. And uh, that's, a, that's really what the uh, waiver of attorney-client privilege issue is all about. Okay. And so is that, is that a common thing that people do? Or is that, I mean, does it kind of depend on the situation? I mean, I remember listening to that and then seeing some responses from people and, and really kind of scratching my head thinking, well, I mean, does that kind of, but does that make sense or does it not make sense? Again, not a lawyer. Most people aren't. And most people, you know, we want to give advice or just speak about something, especially in our modern day, without really having much idea what we're even talking about. So is that like a normal, a normal thing or no? No, it's a very it's a very unusual thing to waive the attorney client privilege. Okay. Uh, because it the attorney client privilege is there for a number of reasons. Um, in the civil context, it's there to protect uh, communications and to encourage candor. You know the the there are lots of ways to to approach an issue, and you know sometimes uh, uh, someone can be on the outside looking at just select facts and come to a conclusion that isn't really the the correct conclusion mm. you know if if a person is able to look at all of the facts and what the attorney client privilege does is it allows people to communicate freely and you know even to communicate mere suspicions and and it'll establish a direction for an investigation and going through the investigation it's not at all unusual to begin with a suspicion and it not and it not pan out. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've, uh, a recent investigation that I've done, there was a, a a real question and a suspicion that maybe a staff person at a church had mishandled a matter. It wasn't a question of that person's misconduct or anything like that. But there was a matter that uh, was reported at the church, and the the first suspicion was that perhaps this church leader uh, was. Uh, handled the matter in a, in a way that was more calculated to conceal it than to actually address it. Mm. Once we got into it and, you know, I interviewed, I don't know, half a dozen witnesses at, at some length. Uh, once we got through that process, it became clear that this leader had handled it very well. He had, mm. he had really done everything that he should have done. And in fact, in a lot of ways, his response was a model of how someone should respond. Now, you know, if there had not been the protection of the attorney-client privilege, those suspicions would have been the thing that everybody pays attention to. Yeah. And if you think about, you know, the in the Me Too culture uh, and the kind of the Believe Women mantra, uh, suspicion and allegation has taken the place of evidence mm. and of facts. You know, I, I kind of look at the Kavanaugh uh, Supreme Court confirmation as a bit of an inflection point in our country because it's the first time in my observation that the whole idea of the facts not really mattering, only the allegations mattering, uh, came to the forefront. And, and, you know, there there are many people, I think it's part of the postmodern mindset of of there not really being any such thing as truth, only perspective. Uh, That's the first time that that mindset has really uh, come to the forefront and and I, I think it's defining much of our public discourse now. Yeah. And so uh, to kind of connect that to to the attorney client privilege, if you take something that's just a suspicion or an allegation and you put that out, then those who have an agenda are going to clamp onto that and that's going to become their narrative. Yeah. As opposed to 
allowing a process to take place. And, you know, due process is a biblical notion. Uh, you know, a person couldn't be convicted except on the testimony of two or more witnesses. That's even embedded in our criminal law now. Mm-hmm. Um, and there, there's a reason for that. Uh, and, and it is that, you know, uh, allegation alone uh, should not ever be a substitute for truth. And if, the, if you take away the attorney-client privilege, then you, you short-circuit that process. And I think it plays into the hands of activists who have more interest in, interest in pursuing a narrative than they do in pursuing the truth. Mm. And that's the problem. Um, it's, I don't think you'll find any lawyer, uh, aside from a handful of activist lawyers, who would say that waiving the attorney-client privilege is a good idea. And just to put it in perspective, the law firm that had been representing the executive committee for over 50 years resigned over the waiver of the attorney-client privilege. Well, And you know, I, if I had been in that position, I think I would do the same thing well, because it's such an ill-advised uh, uh, decision because it opens the doors to people that won't handle things responsibly. Mm-hmm. And they do not have the same goal as that the executive committee, you know, as an, as an entity of the Southern Baptist Convention has. You know, the, the SBC is an organization that is about the gospel mm-hmm. and about supporting churches and supporting uh, international mission efforts and, and also, you know, national mission efforts. Well, that's not the goal of the activists that, that were agitating for the waiver of the privilege. Yeah. Uh, in fact, some would suggest, and I think I would probably be among these, that the activists are probably intent on taking down the SBC, uh, of tearing down institutions. That That's very much a part of where we are in our, our culture now, is tearing down institutions. And, uh, you know, that's, I think, a part of that whole postmodern agenda, mm-hmm. uh, to tear down and replace. And uh, that has now arrived at the doorstep of the SBC. Wow. So we don't yet know what the impact of that's going to be, but I don't think it'll be a good thing. I don't think it's going to foster uh, an inquiry that leads to the discovery of truth mm-hmm. that allows uh, the you know well-intentioned and properly motivated people uh, to do justice in the face of you know legitimate harms that have been done to people. Wow. Um, now they got they obviously had a different team of lawyers. Uh, replace the one that had been representing for 50 years. I thought I read that that law firm also supports like the human rights campaign and a few other like leftist or is I'm, it, am I'm I, not, am I mis- fami- okay. not okay. familiar with that. Well, I'm not familiar, but, but what I will say is uh, look, look at what hap- what's happened with the Boy Scouts. Mm. Okay. Once, once the, um, these, these activists uh, trained their sites on the Boy Scouts. Um, they pushed it into bankruptcy. Yeah, wow. And so, you know, the, the Boy Scouts is, a, I think it's called Scouting USA now or yeah. something like that. Um, they're in Chapter 11 bankruptcy because there was this flood of claims against them. Mm. And so really what waiver of the attorney-client privilege does is it opens the floodgates to the trial lawyers to come in and decimate the SBC and to, to uh, gain access to the, to the money that the SBC has accumulated over the years for mission purposes. And, and I, I am a trial lawyer. I, you know, I do that kind of work in my private practice. And so I, I'm not denigrating trial lawyers necessarily, but you know, we, we see oftentimes activist driven litigation and sometimes the, the truth gets lost in the shuffle of, of, uh, you know, postmodern narrative. Mm-hmm. If I not, not to be so philosophical, but yeah. that's what I see as the real risk of waiving the attorney-client privilege. Not the not the truth that's going to come to light, but the narratives that are going to find support in mere allegation, and and in in allegations of concealment, and uh, you know that that it's just not a good substitute for a process that is designed to discover the truth and to do justice. Yeah. No, that's a good, that's, I appreciate you sharing that because a lot of people don't, you hear and you think, well, that doesn't sound right, but am I only hearing it as a lopsided view or I'm not really understanding what, what's going on or why would they do this or that? But that's, I mean, it's so true <laughs> with just the destroying institutions. I mean, we see, we've seen this for you know years now, but especially in the last four to five years 
with, you know, removing statues and changing names and doing this and this. And, you know, it's, it's basically trying to rewrite history. And I know, and it's such a terrible argument, really, but when people kind of say, well, you know, that's, you, you can't just say it's a slippery slope or, oh, you're just being an alarmist. Or it's like, yeah, but wouldn't you rather somebody say, hey, there's a fire when they think they see smoke and it's a false alarm <laughs> as opposed to sleeping and smelling smoke, seeing smoke, and it is a fire, and now you perish in your fire, in that fire, because you were a fool to not step up and, you know, get out of your bed or something. Um, clearly, we don't want to be looking for demons under every rock and tree, but at the same time, I think we live in a time where even with things with Ukraine or with, with all the COVID stuff, and it's like, well, that's just, you know, people dismiss too easily. And it's like, hold on, these same people were saying this, now they're saying this. And we shouldn't just latch on to whatever the current narrative is, but rather try and step back and think more critically and not just believe allegations, like you're saying. We don't have to speculate uh, over what's going to happen as a consequence of the waiver of the attorney-client privilege by the executive committee. Um, we can predict with a high degree of confidence that lawsuits will follow mm. and that the uh, SBC assets will be uh, consumed in part by the effort to defend, uh, probably by battles with insurance companies, because insurance companies, you know, they, they have to provide a defense, but they may not feel like they should pay, you know, to indemnify, pay, the, pay any damages that the executive committee is required to pay, uh, because the allegations, a lot of these allegations involve uh, allegations of active wrongdoing as mm. opposed to negligent wrongdoing. And, you know, oftentimes there's, there's no coverage for that or there's, there can be a big insurance coverage battle. But, it, but at the end of the day, what will happen is you'll see a, uh, probably a large number of, of people and, and uh, uh, law firms uh, who will organize an effort to pursue the SBC based on allegations that whether they're proven or not, will have a terribly corrosive effect on the ministry of the SBC. Wow. And so, again, kind of like I'm five or six years old, um, why, so they remove the attorney-client privileges, and which then, is it erases kind of a confidentiality, sort of you can talk off the books type of thing? It opens the files of the investigators. Okay. Uh, and so... You know, when, I, when I'm investigating a case, I may make notes based on, you know, a belief that I have at one point in the case, but then as I gain more information, that, that belief may not be borne out by the facts. Well, if you take someone that's constructing a narrative based on an agenda, again, not a truth-seeking uh, approach, but uh, a narrative-driven approach, they may seize upon, you know, something that was a mere suspicion and treat it as though it were a fact. And gotcha. if that if that happens, which is what does happen in these situations, it, it becomes very difficult to defend. I mean think you know, think about think about Twitter mobs or think about cancel culture. You know, sometimes those aren't even based on the truth. Mm -hmm. And when that when that happens, it, it decimates the the people that are the, the object of that. And I, I think that's what some uh, in this activist group are, are going to do to the SBC. And wow. it, it's, it's, not a, it's not a good thing. It isn't gonna make people safer. It's not gonna make children safer. It's not gonna uh, make women subject to abuse in the church safer. Um, there are ways to do that and those things should be done. Mm -hmm. But decimating the SBC, in my opinion, is not the way to do it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the SBC obviously has large, large sums of money from donations and, and giving from cooperative cooperating churches right I mean 40 anywhere from 40 to 50 thousand it's hard to really <laughs> put an actual um, exact number on it because I hear different numbers but it's 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 big but based on even kind of so goes the SBC or how the SBC goes so goes even evangelicalism to a degree um, maybe not in this exact same way but you have like you said earlier the removal and the try and the trying to change or or dismantle uh, institutions. And it's not dismantle institutions because institutions are bad. It's we want to bring up a new institution. 
you know, out, out of the ashes like a phoenix rises and we're all going to be better. And that's a very secular, naturalistic way to look at something. You know, never did a building arise out of a rubble heap. You have to clear it, clean it, do this, put a new foundation, and put thought and energy into that building. And, and it never a building never built itself, right? And, and, and uh, it's unlikely to be built in accordance with the same design. Yeah. Right? I, and I, I think at the core of what the activists want to do is to tear down and to replace with something that reflects modern sensibilities. You know, modern sort of secular cultural sensibilities because that that is creeping into the SBC and and to a variety of, of denominational organizations and it, let, let me make a point here and tie this to the work I'm doing with Act 6 there um, so the SBC is a is a I guess it's in a sense a parachurch organization it's not a local church right it is a it is an organization uh, that's been developed to support local churches and, and I, I would say on a local or state level here, we have the KBC, Kentucky Baptist Convention. And my experience with the KBC is uniformly positive. They, they really do a wonderful job of supporting pastors and other ministries. And, you know, I, I would laud their work without hesitation. But they're not the local church. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, we, it's not an either or. Uh, it's a both and. We should protect and promote uh, both the parachurch organizations like the KBC and the SBC, but our highest level of attention and effort should be devoted to the local church because it is the local church that God has ordained with the purpose uh, you know, of being the visible body of Christ in a given community. Yeah. And, that, you know, that, that, and that's the reason that I, I pursue my efforts through the Act 6 project because I'm, I, I see and, and recognize the unique value of a local church. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think that's, that's clearly the organization that God has ordained to do the work of the Great Commission uh, at a local level. You know, it starts with the family. That's the most fundamental building block. And then it moves to the church. And then kind of out to the side is government. Yeah. God has ordained each of those institutions for his sovereign purposes. And organizations like the SBC and the KBC are beneficial to come alongside lo local churches, but the local church is what's at the front line. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's and uh, that's a good point. And I think a lot of times we have such a top down or you know upside down rather uh, view of of a lot of these matters because we think well. It's a both end of, well, that's not, <clears throat> excuse me, not happening in my church now, so we're not worried about it. But there's this trickle-down effect with, you know, maybe Bible study resources, Sunday school resources, even books that are being promoted and so on. Uh, and or we then think, well, we can't influence the top, so, you know, we're powerless. I'm not going to go to the convention. I'm not going to be a part. I'm not going to speak out on this or that. I'm not going to... Um, do whatever to to help encourage and strengthen the local church but really i mean again like you said the local church is what's ordained not the pca or the sbc or the you know evangelical free denomination or calvary chapel or whatever it's yes those are churches but they're a co collection of churches um whereas the actual local church is is vital uh, and having solid leadership uh, biblical leadership and a biblical framework, which is what you you guys there at Act Six help set up, even like church bylaws and constitution and things like that, right? That's right. That, yeah. yeah, that's right. And and it all it's all built on the conviction that the local church occupies a unique role. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned with the waiving of the privilege, we can kind of anticipate how things will go based on other factors and how people have done this in the past. What should we expect as a local church, a local SBC church, or just even an observer like, well, I'm not SBC, just so it doesn't really affect me very much. Um, what should we expect things to look like maybe for the couple next couple conventions in the summertime and just other news stuff to, to watch out for? My hope is that at this year's convention, which is in Anaheim, yep. uh, you're, you're close to your stomping ground. Yeah that they'll reconsider the issue and that the messengers will direct the executive committee to take that issue back up and to reverse that decision. Now, what we don't know is what's been done 
you know, in view of the, the waiver of the, of the attorney-client privilege. And, you know, one of the problems with that waiver is that maybe the executive committee as a group has chosen to waive it, but, but in doing that, they're waiving protections that individual members of the executive committee were relying upon. Mm. And so it, it's, it's not really fair. It's, it's like me waiving your constitutional rights uh, oh, in a wow. case. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think that is in line with the expectations. Uh, you know, maybe a prospective waiver, uh, a waiver from that date forward, but not a, a, a retrospective waiver. Yeah. And my hope is that the, the messengers will reconsider that issue. Uh, I'm not sure that they made a particularly informed decision um, when they, uh, I don't know that the executive committee made the best decision. And I think what they did is they capitulated to the activists, and that never, ever, ever goes well. No. So uh, yeah. we should we should determine what is the right thing to do, and do that, irrespective of whether we experience criticism from it. Yeah. Because you know capitulating to bullies or activists only feed only you know sends them into a feeding frenzy, and if if it stands and if they open the files. Uh, then I, I, I predict that that doesn't go well for the SBC and its institutions. Wow. Okay. Well, that's good to know. You have any other thoughts on anything else you want to share with us at the moment? The issues with our institutions, uh, denominational institutions, for us as Baptists, uh, get a lot of attention. Yeah. And, you know, they're interesting. I think they're things that we should give some attention to. Uh, and uh, they're not unimportant. However, I, I would, if I'm ranking issues, you know, it's far more important that we pay attention to how we are leading our families. It is far more important to pay attention to how we're leading our churches or uh, participating in the ministry of our churches. And those two areas will have far greater impact than anything that happens with denominational institutions mm. uh, like the executive committee or the International Mission Board or, or any, any other entity. So uh, let's give it some attention, uh, give it the attention that it's due, but let's remember our local efforts are always going to have more impact. Yeah, that's good. No, I appreciate that. Um, well, thank you for joining me, and uh, maybe we'll we'll talk again more. I appreciate the opportunity, yeah. Richard. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, y'all. Well, you guys have a good rest of your day, and um, check out Brian's ministry, axe6project.com. And what was your lawyer website? slg.legal. slg.legal. Check out that if you do need legal issues or rather some maybe some questions answered or something like that. I don't know if he does a lot of Q&As there, but uh, you can probably find some resources there or a good email. Uh, reach out to him and definitely Act 6. I've heard, like I said, uh, you've shared a lot of good testimonies and stories about helping local churches, which definitely is your heart, which is wonderful. So uh, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Richard. Thank you.